So we're gonna go with that, okay? I have read so many books. I kind of forgot the beginning of the month already. It's a Wonderful Life meets Primer, but make it stupid. No! Welcome to my June wrap up. I have way too many books to hold them all up. I am about to lose them all. So um, I think it's 22 and a DNF at my last count. So we're gonna go with that, okay? Welcome. <laughs> So yeah, I read a lot of books in June. I read pretty much everything on my TBR. I still haven't finished Jade War, but I'm gonna read Jade War very, 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 very soon. Hopefully with Jess Owens, if she's still down. Um, Cause she's in the midst of a reread, I believe, of Jade War and has not yet braved Jade Legacy. So we're gonna do Jade War and Jade Legacy together. Emotional support. But I did read a bunch of other books, so. Let's go through them. <laughs> First book I read was Death on the Nile by Agatha Christie. I have read so many books that I kind of forgot the beginning of the month already. I have seen all of the adaptations of it. I, I think I have seen literally all the adaptations, unless there's like some, maybe some foreign language ones that I haven't seen. So I was very, very familiar with a story before reading it, but I wanted to read it anyway. I was familiar with, and then there were none before I read it and I still really, really loved it. I also really wanted to give Poirot a second chance because I read Murder on the Orient Express and I really didn't care for it, but I love all the adaptations, well, no, I love all the David Sushi adaptations of Poirot. So like, I like Poirot when it's adapted. The only Poirot that I had read until now was Orient Express and I was not a fan. So I was hoping that it wasn't just that I don't like Poirot, but that maybe just that one doesn't work for me. And I did like this better. I still don't know if I like Poirot books. We'll see, I'll try a few more. Cause like I have been liking Agatha Christie, like other Agatha Christie books. Poirot is just like, not doing it for me. But Death on the Nile, I did I did enjoy it. I did like it. Definitely better than Orange Express, um, but not as much as I have liked some other Agatha Christie's. It's it's definitely miles and away better than the new adaptation by Kenneth Branagh. Yikes on bikes to that movie. I do really like the David Sushi adaptation as usual. He's just, he is Poirot. And I did listen to this on audio, uh, the audiobook narrated by David Suche, not the audiobook narrated by Kenneth Branagh, because of course he also did an audiobook. Kenneth Branagh needs to stop trying to be David Suchet. It's like, it's not gonna happen. We've got our Poirot. We don't need you. Go away. I do recommend the audiobook and um, this was this was good. I don't know how I would have felt about it if I didn't already know the who of the whodunit. But that being said, it was still interesting to see knowing what already, how it ends and then who did the doing of the done it, uh, when and how clues for that were being placed or if they were not placed or how the reader was being tricked. So. I, I enjoyed it. Not my favorite Christie. This cover is my favorite Christie cover, I think. Although the Book of the Month edition of And Then There Were None is also really, really cool. Book of the Month is doing a good job with covers for Agatha Christie. I'll give him that. So anyway, yeah, it was it was good. I, I'm glad I read it. Next was a reread and that was The Heroes by Jo Abercrombie because as you well know by this point, Bethany and I are hosting a read along on the podcast. The episode for this went up earlier in June. Um, so I'll leave a link for that down below if you wanna check it out. We were joined by Hillary from Bookborn to chat about The Heroes. And um, she, in a surprising turn of events, this is, if not her favorite, now one of her favorite first law books. So it was really fun hearing her perspective on it. Um, so yeah. yeah, like I said, if you wanna hear us chat about it, leave that link down below. But as you know, I love first law. So one more needs to be said. Next up is a book that I've also chatted with Hillary about quite recently, uh, and that is Darling Girl by Liz Mike Michaelski. She and I ranted about this, ven vented about this maybe. Either, either is accurate. Um, I sort of, um, convinced her to read it with the understanding that neither of us expected this to be great because Peter Pan retellings have a bad habit of being terrible. We were like hoping for the best but expecting the worst and even though we were expecting the worst it <laughs> way overshot our expectations. I could not have imagined a book being this bad. So she and I talked about it for like an hour and a half. Um, it's completely spoilery but also we don't think you should read it so go ahead and check out our chat if you missed it. <laughs> Um, and next up, I just, I didn't read them all, um, like, you know, back to back like this, but I put them all in my TBR stack or my wrap up stack all together because um, I didn't put them in my wrap up stack until I had finished the last one. And then I just put them all in the wrap up stack because I wasn't going to talk about them in my wrap up unless I had finished them all. Um, these are all the books that I read for my books that inspired music vlog. So I don't really want to talk about them too much in this wrap up because I talked about them at length in that vlog, but I'll just go them, through them really quickly. Hang on, but before I do that, I was going to do this first because I was like, before I forget. And then I forgot. I did read some books that I don't have physical copies of. So I wanted to get 
through those since they're not in my stack. Books that I did not have physical copies of include The Psychopath Test, um, which uh, someone on a live stream I was watching, like a legal live stream, recommended it. Um, it was a lot more narrative than I was expecting, um, but from how they talked about it, I thought it would be more, I don't know, more, I mean, it is nonfiction, but I thought it would be more technical. Um, it's, it's more narrative. It was interesting. And it was kind of about how, um, psychopathy, is that the word? Uh, came about, like how the word for that came about and how it is applied. And like, we think of these things as relatively cut and dry. Like if you have this diagnosis, well, then they know, but like, it's actually kind of nebulous. And the way that the history of its treatment and its labeling and, and that kind of thing is a little, little concerning. <laughs> Um, but it was, yeah, it was an interesting read. So I would recommend it. It's not very long. And then I also read The Forever War, which was a reread by Joe Haldeman. I reread that because, um, my friend Michael asked me to participate in a project that I don't think is up yet related to sci-fi books. And, um, I hadn't read The Forever War in a while, so I wanted to refresh myself. So that's why I read it again. It's not a favorite. It wasn't a favorite when I read it the first time and I didn't really change. I think it got worse in this reread. Um, but it is an interesting book that is a classic for a reason, but it's kind of hard to read it. It's like socioculturalness is um, pretty dated and kind of offensive, but um, the science ideas in it are pretty interesting. Okay, yeah, those are the only books that I don't have physical copies of that I read in June. Okay, all, off we go. So back to the books that inspired music. There were six. Um, they were In Watermelon Sugar by Richard Brodigan, Me and the Devil by Nick Toshis, 1984 by George Orwell, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, East of Eden by John Steinbeck, and Billy Liar by Keith Waterhouse. Um, like I said, I talked about them at length in that vlog. If you want to see that, I'll leave that linked down below. Um, but I really enjoyed doing this project um, and I definitely got to read some books that I normally wouldn't read. So overall, um, this was pretty successful. I, I liked the majority of what I read. Next up is The Wall of Storms by Ken Liu. Uh, my patrons and I are doing a read-along of the Dandelion Dynasty. Uh, so we read Wall of Storms in June and uh, we haven't chatted about it yet. Uh, like our official, you know, live chat to discuss it. Um, but I think nearly everybody, like my patrons, but also outside of my patrons, uh, like in the general reading sphere on booktube, etc., I think the consensus is that Wall of Storms is better than Grace of Kings. And because I'm me, I liked Grace of Kings better than Wall of Storms. I liked Wall of Storms, don't get me wrong. I definitely liked Wall of Storms and I'm liking the Dandelion Dynasty, but I did like Grace of Kings a smidge better because of course I did. These books are kind of hard to talk about in any kind of brevity because they're really dense and meaty and expansive and um, there's a lot to them. This being a sequel makes it doubly difficult to talk about. Um, the things that that made me like it a little bit less were that there's a lot more tech talk in this than in the first one. Like Ken Liu likes to have a lot of that in like when he describes inventions that are in his world, devices, things like that. He goes into a, a large amount of detail into how they work and I appreciate it insofar as like he's put a lot of thought into this actually functioning and I believe my understanding from uh, my friend Kyle is that he actually does for the most part, if not always, create like prototypes of the stuff that is in his books to confirm that it would function, which is like, that's really cool. And I, if you're going to have a lot of like lengthy explanations of how stuff in your world works, better that than just stuff you're pulling out of your ass <laughs> that is just like magic and, and there's no way to confirm that that works and you're just like making stuff up, then I'm really irritated. So here, like, I have an appreciation for it, but it was still a lot. There was a lot of times where that was going on and it would just like go on for so long that it would take, that it would, it would ruin the flow of the story. So I, I respect it a great deal, but I can't claim to enjoy those parts of the book that much. And then also uh, without spoilers, I felt like the, the conflict, the setup of the conflict and who's involved in it was a little bit more interesting and nuanced and, and, complicated and gray in Grace of Kings here. It was a much more traditional conflict villain setup and still very, very well done. But there was just a, a delicious messiness to it in Grace of Kings that I just personally found much more fascinating than Wall of Storms. Wall of Storms, like I said, well done, very well done. It has layers and complexity, don't get me wrong. But just as compared to the conflict in Grace of Kings, is a little more on the like traditional cliche side. And I don't want to say cliche because it really isn't. It's well done. It's just more of a traditional kind of 
conflict narrative than what you get in Grace of Kings. So th those are my reasons. I still think it's a, it's really good, but I liked Grace a little better. Next is The Golden Fool by Robin Hobb. I did post a review of this uh, kind of in combination with um, Fool's Errand, which I did read the two months ago. Um, because Fool's Errand, I did not like that much and I didn't really want to post a review for it for that reason. And this was so much better. And I really feel like Fool's Errand is a prologue to this, which is mainly what why I did the video together with the both of them. Golden Fool, we're back. This is so good. Five stars, yes. I still think I like Farseer Trilogy better than Tawny Man Trilogy, but I have not finished the Tawny Man Trilogy. So my, my opinion might be swayed by the final installment, but Golden Fool is really good, is really emotional, is, is Hob at her best, absolutely wrecks you. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading Fool's Fate. Next up is a book that I DNF'd. I think it might be my, it might be my first DNF of the year, maybe my second. I can't remember what the second, oh yes, it is definitely at least my second. That is When Night Breaks by Janelle Angelis. And like, it's not because this is like, I have read much worse books this year that I have read to their, like in their entirety, but those books, like the reason that I finished them for the most part would be because it was in some way like an obligation book. Like I had agreed to read it with somebody or something like that. There was no reason to read this other than to want to. It was not on my TBR, it was not a buddy read, it was not anything. Um, the main reason I picked it up now was this is a sequel to uh, Where Dreams Descend. And I didn't really like Where Dreams Descend there that much. Like I probably wouldn't have con even considered going on to read the second one. Not because it was the worst thing ever, just because I thought it was like, extremely forgettable and very mediocre and just like not my kind of thing. These are like YA romance centric fantasy books. Uh, the first one is influenced or inspired by Moulin Rouge and Phantom of the Opera. I like Phantom of the Opera, I don't really like Moulin Rouge. And I don't really feel like those influences were, were I mean they were, there was like some window dressing that was reminiscent of both of those. Anyway, um, yeah, I didn't really plan to read on, um, but then I was informed that the sequel, um, on, like the, where the first one took inspiration from those other two musicals, um, this one, it was my understanding to takes its inspiration from Hades Town, which I am obsessed with. And I have seen Hades Town on stage now three times, and I might very possibly see it a fourth time. So like, I, I knew I had tickets for to see Hades Town when I found that out. And I was like, well, after I go see Hades Town, then I'll give this a go. Um, so after seeing Hades Town three times, I started reading this and immediately it irritated me to the high heavens. Like, from the beginning. I was like, I am already so annoyed with the writing style, with the types of characters that these are, with the, with the type of thing that this is going to be. And I was just like, I don't want this. I don't want to read this. I'm not going to have fun with this. There's no reason to read this. I'm not going to do a review for it. I'm not buddy reading it with anybody. Nah, I'm nah. Just, there's no reason. So I, I, I just DNF'd it. And it's still in its wrapping, as you may have noticed, because I was listening to, I got the audiobook from the library. Um, so this is all still in its perfect condition uh, and I can uh, pass it on to somebody who will like it more. Uh, next up is the Sword of Truth book that we read for the month and that was Faith of the Fallen by Terry Goodkind. The live show for this was on my channel. This was formerly my favorite uh, Sword of Truth book. I mean I never had lists and favorites and official anything like that when I read these books originally but back when I read them originally I was like if I had been asked and now in my recollection being asked I was like I remember that being probably my favorite. This time around it was not my favorite but it was really interesting to me to read it now and to understand what it is about it that really hit so hard for me because it, it was definitely a situation of being the right book for the right reader at the right time. Like when I read this the first time, it was ex the exact book that I needed for where I was like mentally and emotionally and in life. Uh, now I am not there anymore. So now reading it, I was like, I. It's quite flawed. Um, I still had a good time reading it. I still think it's a pretty good book, but yeah. <laughs> it was giving me something that I desperately needed at the time and I don't need that anymore. So now I can just sort of assess it on its own actual merits. And I was like, okay, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good, but like it's not the uh, life-changing experience that it was for me back when I read it the first time. So anyway, if you wanna hear me and Bethany chat about it, the live show was on my channel, but I'll leave a link down below anyway, so check it out. The next up is a backlist book of the month club book because I like to get through those when I can to clear those out. <laughs> that is Fountains of Silence by Ruta Sepetis. Um, I had been meaning to read Ruta Sepetis for a long long time and I do own a couple of other books from her not from book of the month. I own Between Shades of Grey and Salt of the Sea. Yeah Salt of the Sea. I've heard always nothing but incredible things about Ruta Sepetis books and 
I mean, I'll, I, I'll, I own two others, so I'll probably read them in particular between Shades of Grey because of my own ethnicity and, and family background. Uh, briefly, if you don't know, Between Shades of Grey is about a Lithuanian girl um, who was sent to Siberia during um, Soviet occupation. And I'm Latvian and I have a many, a great many members of my family. Um, uh, my ancestors, my ancestors also went through that. So that's something that I feel closely tied to. So I would like to read that book for that reason, because it's not something that there's a lot of books about. Um, Fountains of Silence is about the uh, Franco era of Spain, Franco dictatorship in Spain. And this is a, a thing in history that I did not know about. So I, I like, you know, when historical fiction authors find out a thing that is lesser known and they're like, people don't know about this. This is so interesting. Or this is so horrifying. Or why don't people know about this? And write a book about it. So I appreciate that this gave me new information and new knowledge that yeah, I feel like it is kind of surprising that people don't know about it or that it isn't talked about more. But I don't think this was that good a book. <laughs> like, I don't think it was very well written. The characters felt very two-dimensional. I did not care about any of the characters, like literally at all. And I also couldn't really tell them apart for a lot of the time. Like, by the middle of the book, like, I had enough, like, facts about them in my mind where I was like, okay, when a name would pop up, you're the one that does this, saw this, went to here, it has this job. But it still wasn't like a person to me with a personality. It was just like, oh, under the title of your name falls these facts. Under the title of your name falls these facts. I know which one you are. But they didn't have like distinct voices, distinct personalities, distinct anything. So the, the thing that I most enjoyed about this book was learning about this thing of history that I did not know about. Because I don't think it was very atmospheric either. I didn't really feel transported to a different era of Spain or Spain at all. It felt very flat and lackluster and kind of going through the motions to me. If you love this, you know, I'm happy for you. Um, so I appreciate the project and I do appreciate learning something um, from it. Like I like that I've learned something, but I don't think it was that good a book. So I'm a little nervous about reading particularly Between Shades of Grey because I will feel um, like personally let down by it if I don't think it's a good book just because of my personal connection to that history. So I'll, I'll be like, you did a sturdy by not doing this better if, if in fact I don't like it that much. I'm hoping that I really, really like it. Um, but anyway, this, it wasn't bad, but it was very meh in my opinion. Next up is a book that, um, is, is quite popular and I've been looking forward to it for years and that is Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. In this book, the only points I can give it, and this is not nothing, are that it is very readable. It is compulsively, compellingly bingeable. But it's really stupid. <laughs> this is really, really stupid. Um, so reading this book is like not dissimilar from watching like, you know, bad TV shows. We were like, this isn't good. This doesn't make sense. But, you know, it's kind of addicting to watch this. So Dark Matter is... The, I gave it a one sentence review on Goodreads, not dissimilar from the one sentence review that I gave to a Lady's Guide to Mischief and Mayhem, which was, this is, it's a wonderful life meets primer, but make it stupid. Because I, I don't want to spoil anything because this is a popular book. And if you want to read it, then, you know, be my guest. I don't want to spoil it for you. But the like science, because it's like a science thriller or a, a, a sci-fi thriller or something. I guess that's how you'd call it. Because um, it like takes a sci-fi concept and then basically the book itself is a thriller. But uh, instead of being, you know, a, a murder mystery or something like that, it's to do with like a sci-fi thing. And the sci-fi thing is so poorly executed. It is, it is laughably bad, the execution. Like, I am not a scientist. I am merely a person who has consumed some sci-fi and occasionally watched a PBS documentary about this, that, or other science concept. Like... I am not an expert, but I know that this is not how this works and would never work. It was, it was, it was really, really, really stupid. So yeah, uh, if you're going to be irritated by that kind of thing, then don't read this. Um, but if you can find entertainment from things that don't make a lick of sense, then maybe read it. Because it's a quick one and you'll get through it fast. Because it is a thriller, so you'll most likely find yourself wanting to turn the page and wanting to know what's next and what the mystery is, etc. Um, but it's so, so dumb. Next up is the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them. And that was Hyperion by Dan Simmons. And I really, really enjoyed this. And I already started and have almost finished The Fall of Hyperion. 
I was I thought I might finish it before the end of June but you'll soon see why that didn't happen because I got a little sidetracked by um, something else. Anyway, I did really, really enjoy this. I can see why it's so widely talked about. And yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I talked about it at length in the vlog I did for my patrons. It's, um, yeah, I am I am impressed by this. I am, there, there are specific things about it that date it for me. Like it, you can tell that it is a little bit older. Um, not just because of like writing style, but like certain things in it. I have a little bit of trepidation about where I think it might be going and what that might mean. But I'm, I have an open mind and the journey is still excellent. So if it does go more in a direction that I would not think that favorably of, I will still, I think, will think that this is um, an, uh, a quite staggering project, even if like the end point is one that I'm like, well, I would have preferred not, not that. But Anyway, I, I was very, very, very impressed with this. Um, and as I said, I am already almost done with Fall of Hyperion and I will in all likelihood continue on to read the next, I think there's four books. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very glad they picked this for me. Next up is a book that it pains me to say, I really, really, really hate it. That was Daughter of Red Winter by Ed McDonald. Um, I better read this with Alan and he and I are going to chat about it soon. <laughs> Date TBD uh, as of the filming of this video. Maybe we've already chatted by the time this goes up. I don't know. I received an ARC, an E-ARC, as well as a physical ARC. This was one of my most anticipated releases for the year. And it, Ed McDonald is the author of the Ravensmark trilogy, which is um, on my list of top 10 fantasy of all time. So like, I am a fan. I am a fan of Ed McDonald. He did write Daughter of Redwinter, my understanding is, before he published and before he wrote and then published Raven's uh, Mark. Um, and so he went back to this old manuscript, polished it, edited it down. It's also my understanding this was like three times longer and that he had to like chop it down a lot, fix it up a bit. And it's now being, this series is now being published. And that's the only thing that makes this make sense for me because this feels like it was written, like it's a very amateurish writing style. Like there's things about it that I'm like, you can see kind of like the Ed McDonald that I know and love and things that like clearly where his interests lie, the types of things that he likes to do in his stories. Like you can see it in there. But I can't be like, it's there's other utterly nothing of Ed McDonald in here. There obviously is. But it's like the really, really crappy like store brand version. Yeah, like uh, the, the story concept itself is a pretty good one. And I could see if I someone told me of this, this pitch for an idea and who would I like to see write it? I'd be like, Ed McDonald would be great to write that. But I feel like... Yeah, I feel like if he started from scratch nowadays at, with this story concept, he could write something great. But I think this just has too many leftovers from when he was a less competent, less experienced writer. It's, I mean, I'll talk about it more with Alan when we have our chat, because um, I have a lot of thoughts. But I gave this one star. And I would have DNF'd it if I wasn't for the fact that this is an arc that I agreed to review, that I would agree to talk about it with Alan, and that this was by Ed McDonald. And I kept holding out hope that something would change my mind. And I, it didn't. Uh, this was awful. Uh, next up was, I think, the only other Sally Rooney book that I had left to read. She might have one other. The only Sally Rooney book that I owned anyway that I still had to read, and that was Conversations with Friends. This was the earliest book, at least, again, that I owned. She might have written something before this, um, maybe short stories, maybe a full novel, but this was a, an earlier book of hers than Normal People, or obviously the newest Beautiful World, Where Are You? Um, and this does feel, uh, it's not as bad as the Ed McDonald situation, by reading this, I was like, okay, this is not as good as Normal People or Beautiful World, Where Are You? But this is still quint the quintessentially the same kind of thing that you get and you expect from Sally Rooney. So I did really, really enjoy this. Um, it just felt like a less good version of what I had seen her do in Normal People and Beautiful World, Where Are You? Because I think those two are, are better books. But I definitely enjoyed this and I don't regret reading it. But um, she's clearly grown as a writer, uh, which is always nice to see. And now we come to the reason why I did not finish Fall of Hyperion, and that's because I got swallowed up into the Simon Snow hole. No, I don't like that phrasing. I absolutely do not. No, I can't say that. Okay, uh, let's try that again. I got sucked into the Simon Snow verse. That's better. I've been wanting to read Carry On pretty much since it came out, but I, I either knew this like when it came out or learned it shortly thereafter that this was a spin-off of Fangirl. And for years I was like, well, I can't read this until I read Fangirl, even though everyone and their mother was like, you can read it. You don't have to read Fangirl. I was like, I must read Fangirl, but I don't want to read Fangirl. So earlier this year, my wanting to read Carry On won out over my not wanting to read Fangirl. And I did read Fangirl. And I actually really, really liked Fangirl way more, not just like more than I expected to, which I did like it more than I expected to do since I expected not to like it. But I like, 
I loved Fangirl. Um, so I finally got around to now reading Carry On and um, was immediately obsessed with Carry On. And within two days, I read Carry On, Wayward Son, and Any Way the Wind Blows. And um, that's it. No more. I've run out of Simon Snow books because I would have kept going if there was more. I would have just kept going. I would not be filming this right now. I'd be in the middle of reading whatever came after that. I am a fan. And also, I'm kind of sad. This has nothing to do with anything. Well, it kind of has to do with it. But like, you can see this is a hardcover of Carry On with this dust jacket. But originally, this was not the cover for Carry On. Um, it was this like, I'll put a picture of it. And that's the that's this edition that I have. Um, and then as they when they started releasing these covers instead, they did a promotion where like they were sending out just a dust jacket to cover your old carry on hardcover. So a friend of mine, because I missed that promotion, a friend of mine, she got she got one of those and she didn't really care about it. So she was like, you can have my dust jacket. So I put the new dust jacket on the old carry on book. But now they've released them in hardcover with these covers and a different um, hardcover book inside. Different end papers, a different color. Like this is the old carry on book. Like this, like, so this is like the old, this goes with the old cover and the old font of carry on. Yeah, so I wish I had kept the dust jacket. I did for a while, but then Kaz sat on it. So it got kind of squished and I was like, oh, what am I keeping this for? Um, so I got rid of it. And now they're they're doing these in hardcover, which I've ordered because it is a different book underneath as well. And it's not, um, you can see this is kind of flat, like it's not embossed, like the the word like the title is for the others, like it's not shiny, you know, you know, you know. So anyway, I've ordered it, but like I could have just had the old edition of Carry On complete. Now this is like a weird Frankenstein <laughs> carry on. In addition to these editions, I do have the uh, Barnes and Noble editions and I will shortly have the Indigo editions. <laughs> Cause I'm obsessed. <laughs> and I'm gonna film a review I think for the whole series. So that's to come. But basically I really, really love these books and we'll probably just reread them because there aren't any more. And I'm currently looking at options for merch because um, I don't have any and uh, I need some. So yeah, those are all the books that I read in June. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you let me know, I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well, but on Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you.